Good evening, everyone. My name is Kaylee Perre Shaughnessy, and I'm the executive director of the Whittier Birthplace. It's my pleasure to welcome tonight's speaker. Michael Hamilton is the executive manager of the Mary Baker Eddy Library. He came to the position following 10 years in the religion and philosophy department at Principia College in Elsa, Illinois. Prior to teaching, he served for 20 years as an active duty US Navy chaplain, ministering to units in both the Navy and the Marine Corps. He holds a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and his research and writing is focused on American religions. Thank you, Michael. We're really excited to have you with us tonight to learn more about Mary Baker Eddy and John Greenleaf Whittier. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me, Kaylee, and thank you all for um, spending some time with me tonight. I'm going to be uh, doing what in some ways may be a kind of standard presentation with some slides and uh, some other uh, things that I'll be showing you. At any point along the way, uh, feel free to interject if you'd like to ask a question. They don't have to wait till the end. It's possible that I'll ask you to defer just a little bit and let you know that's coming up. But if I can, I'll answer it on the spot. If I don't see you, you know, you can use the hand raise icon and I will leave time at the end for questions. I promise Kaylee that I won't go long. We'll, we'll keep this within the boundaries. So let me go ahead and begin. But uh, let me begin by asking just a, a housekeeping question. Can you all hear me okay? And can you all see me okay? All right, great. Yeah, we're all Zoom experts now. Two years of uh, enforced practice. We're all good at this, I think, or at least better than I ever was beforehand. Um, I'm going to share my screen and there'll be a parade of a few different things across it. I say more experienced, but that doesn't mean that at times I'm still a little clunky on Zoom, so bear with me. And uh, here's my here's my first clunk in that I was going over the slides, and that's really my last slide. So I want to take you back a little bit. You're seeing the whole thing from the from the back to the front. Um, John Greenleaf Whittier and Mary Baker Eddy. Uh, their lives did touch at Amesbury, and that's part of the presentation this evening, but uh, there are a few things I'd like to do with you, if I might. One is to um, just touch briefly on the biographies of Whittier and Eddy. I think you all are well acquainted with Whittier's life, and so I don't want to go into any detail there. In fact, I've really enjoyed learning more. Um, what I want to do is just see if there are a few touch points between uh, Whittier and Eddie and their uh, life stories. Then I'd like to take a look at uh, a couple of the themes that seem common between uh, John Greenleaf Whittier and Mary Baker Eddy as poets. Um, Whittier, of course, is uh, you know an outstanding, renowned poet. Eddie's vocation was not as a poet, although it, as I'll explain in just a little bit, that's really what she wanted to be uh, from childhood on. And then uh, we'll take a look at where their paths crossed in Amesbury, how they crossed, and then see if there are ways in which Whittier's influence carries on in Mary Baker Eddy's career and in the religion she founds, Christian science. How is Whittier's influence reflected? And I found that it is both Whittier as a poet and in some ways Whittier as a Quaker. Um, and then perhaps go just a little bit more general and think a little bit about uh, Eddie's religious trajectory and Whittier's Quakerism. And then we'll move into uh, time for your questions and comments. But as I say, feel free to make those questions and comments along the way. One thing I uh, do want to interject before we go too much further is just a little bit about the Mary Baker Library. And to do that, I'm going to need to stop sharing and share a screen again. So um, stand by as I get ready to do that. We've got time to go here. 
the Mary Baker Eddy Library, as some of you may know, is located in Boston. And I've been there for about going on nine years now. The library is really the authoritative source on the life and career of Mary Baker Eddy as a religious leader, as uh, someone of interest to people in a number of different disciplines. And one of the ways that we uh, interact with the public is through our website. The reason I wanted to bring this to your attention is that if any of you are interested in exploring our website, one place you could start would be to type in on our search, uh, our magnifying glass, just type in Whittier. And there you'll find that we have an interesting article on Eddie and Whittier and their interaction. There's a lot more on our website and the library is uh, really primarily an archive uh, that holds Eddie's papers and the organizational records of her church. Uh, a significant movement in New England and now throughout the world. The library also hosts public programs, one of which is a podcast called Seekers and Scholars. It also posts articles about Eddie and the history of the Christian science movement and its many different manifestations uh, through time and around the world. And we're also involved in an interesting uh, publishing and annotation project where we are um, we are transcribing, verifying, annotating all of Mary Baker Eddy's correspondence and publishing it online. This is one of those papers projects that's a lot like other papers projects you might be familiar with. You know, they range from the big presidential projects to uh, much smaller ones about figures that, you know, heretofore might not have been well known or unfortunately even forgotten and, and neglected. Another aspect of our work that's quite important is answering patron questions. When I first got to my job, I thought there must just be a finite number of questions that people could ask about Mary Baker Eddy and about the Christian science movement. But what I'm finding nine years in is that there seem to be an infinite variety of questions that people can ask. And we um, answer a couple of thousand people's questions a year. And so that keeps us very busy. We also have exhibits uh, both online and then at our brick and mortar location, which many of you who are uh, from Massachusetts may be familiar with there on Massachusetts Avenue in uh, between really the back bay and south end sections of Boston, uh, where Eddie's mother church, the Christian Science Mother Church, the First Church of Christ Scientist, has been located since the 1890s. So that's just a little bit about the Mary Baker Eddy Library, where I come from and who I'm representing. But now let's turn back to the real reason that we're together, and that is our friend Whittier. Let me just enlarge my slides again. Go just a little bit bigger. I'm coming back to you to get you on the screen. Sorry, I thought I was so expert. I feel a little clunky tonight. Thank you for your patience. Um, let me enlarge this again, just so it's a little bit more visible. I just wanted to maybe touch on Eddie's interest in and admiration for Whittier. Um, Eddie said of herself, I was a verse maker and she was a homegrown kind of poet. You may know that Mary Baker Eddie was uh, born in New Hampshire, grew up on a farm there. She is not, uh, she comes on the scene, birth date 1821. So she's born uh, more than 10 years after Whittier. But in some ways, they share some of the same world, I think. The world of uh, New England in the uh, first decades and middle decades of the 
19th century. Her background is decidedly rural. Her father is a farmer, um, a fairly successful farmer, and her family is part of the kind of country gentry of the uh, township of Bow, where she's born and lives till she's 14. But for purposes of our discussion, I think it's interesting to see the fact that, see that the way Eddie wants to express herself from early on is uh, through poetry. And as a writer of verse, she is also a pretty voracious reader of poetry. Of course, in her earliest years, uh, Whittier is not yet well known. If I remember correctly, Whittier's first published as a poet when I think he's 19. Um, in, uh, I, I want to venture that it might be, that might be 1839, if I'm remembering correctly, but feel free to correct me on that, Kaylee. Is it about 1839? Uh, it's, he's born in 1807, so uh, in, the, in the 1820s, yeah. Uh, got it, got it, thank you. Yeah, right, 1820s. So, Eddie's own appetite for poetry, she comes into contact with Whittier later as a poet, but in her earlier life, she's a lover of a Shelley, of Byron, and particularly of a poet who's almost forgotten now, but who was just a sensation in her time, and that's Felicia, Felicia Hemans. I don't know if any of you have heard of Felicia Hemmons. They they called her Mrs. Hemmons in her time. And by the time uh, young Mary encounters her, uh, Mrs. Hemmons is already dead. But in her short life, she gushed poetry in, in an incredibly rich and um, uh, really a kind of diffuse career. And so Eddie's early interest in poetry is nourished by these male poets who are still well known today, but I think it's well worth noting that I think really Felicia Hammonds was her hero in some ways. Uh, she was also influenced by the novels of Sir Walter Scott. The Waverly novels were very important to her as uh, a teenager, as were the novels of the Bronte sisters. Um, I think <laughs> you know, the Brontes, their heroines, outwardly so decorous, inwardly so rebellious. Um, there was something about that that I think maybe touched uh, Mary Baker Eddy's uh, girlhood heart, and it shows up later in her career. She's the youngest of six children, and so her life and her path uh, as a woman in some ways is quite different from Whittier's. Um, she doesn't establish herself early in life as he does. In fact, her early life seems to be sort of a, a series of disasters in some ways, uh, though the family is close-knit and supportive by the time she's a young woman. As some of you may know, uh, she marries, her husband dies after six months of yellow fever. They're a thousand miles from home. She's pregnant. She has to make her way home. She's sick. Um, and from there, she's a single mother, she's ill, but through it all, she is writing, and she's writing mostly poetry. She's publishing it, too, um, and in some, sometimes, uh, you know, journals that now sound pretty antique to us, the Odd Fellows Journal, uh, the Covenanter, but she also finds her way into some more well-respected publications like Godey's Ladies Book, and in those efforts as a poet, she tastes public recognition, but she's not able really to establish herself as a poet. And it's through a kind of series of trials where she marries again, I think in part to regain custody of her son, who's been sent to live with with foster parents and a kind of disastrous marriage, although it's affectionate, but still pretty disastrous, that she gains a lot of her outlook on life and life experience. Shot through all this, here's some, something I think we could draw 
a thread of connection between uh, Whittier and Eddie is a pretty profound religious inclination and religious sense. Um, Eddie's religious background is in congregationalism and not the Quakerism of uh, Whittier. She's well read in the Bible. The Bible is kind of the grist that her family grinds in there, her family mill growing up and the Bible becomes sort of her, her resource during those hard times in the 1840s and 50s. Whittier, of course, is, uh, you know, a beca has become before the Civil War a noted abolitionist, uh, using his pen to uh, support the cause of abolition. Eddie, in kind of a more minor key, does the same. She writes poetry, she writes letters to newspapers, uh, other things to support the abolitionist cause, which for her is kind of countercultural. Unlike Whittier, she doesn't come out of an abolitionist background. Her family are Jacksonian Democrats. Um, and as some of you know, the uh, Jacksonian Democrats were, uh, as supporters of Jackson, they, they felt very strongly that the abolitionists were going to break up the Union and that they were acting against the best and greater interests of the country at large. So when Eddie finally emerges as uh, writing poetry, letters, some prose on abolition, it's a mark of her sort of stepping out beyond the shadow of her family of origin. And uh, we're getting close to their, um, to the time when they meet, which I'll come to in just a moment. They meet in 1868 in uh, Amesbury. But leading up to that, Eddie has what's become sort of her <laughs> famous experience at Lynn, where she's injured out on a sub-zero night. She falls on the sidewalk, hits her head, is carried insensible to a house. And the next couple of days, she's sort of alternately unconscious and in agony and uh, asks that the Bible be brought to her. She reads an account of one of Jesus' healings from the Bible. In later years, she's not always 100% sure which one it was, which have caused some of her critics to raise an eyebrow, but she's not really sure later on. But that account speaks to her. She's she's already a, you know, a professing Christian, but this speaks to her apparently in a very different way than uh, these texts had before. And the result is that she gets up off her sick bed, walks into the next room and says, you know, God has healed me. And of course, there's like everything else about her life, there's been controversy about that account and what follows and what came before. But I think what is for sure is that her life trajectory changes at that point. She goes from uh, you know, a kind of dependent state in which it appears she's probably reaching the end of a kind of sad life and launches into a kind of spiritual and religious career that, I mean, in one sense, really wasn't open to women in her time. She, she seems kind of oblivious to that in some ways. And um, this is where she encounters Whittier just a couple of years after that in 1868. We'll get to that in just a minute. That's just a teaser. Um, one thing that I thought was quite interesting in her estimate of and interest in Whittier is that she does read. We know that she reads his poetry and is acquainted with his poetry. And uh, one of the kind of artifactual ways we know that is we have her copy of his poem, Snowbound. And on the back of that copy, she writes her own poem, Lines After Reading Snowbound. So let me, you know, actually, 
was going to show you that, but so I don't keep switching back and forth. Let me just go right to her own lines. The, the letter itself is interesting to look at, but maybe the lines are more important. Um, I, by the way, uh, you know, with your interest in Whittier and the Whittier birthplace, um, I'm sure some of you are, are lovers of his poetry. And one thing I'd forgotten until encountering it again is that Whittier writes these, you know, extended uh, verses and um, Snowbound is definitely one of them. Maybe I will, let's, let's give, let's give a little something for Whittier himself here, since that's what this site is all about. I was just thinking it would be nice to uh, maybe just read a little bit from that. I, I'm reading it for a reason. Let's see if I can find, yeah, there it is. Let me just bring it up on the screen. I, I don't mean to uh, read something you're all deeply familiar with, but I thought because Eddie responds to it so strongly, Maybe it'd just be worth taking, I, not the whole thing, don't worry, <laughs> just, a, just a verse or two. One thing that um, I thought was so interesting, as some of you know, with Snowbound, it opens not with Whittier's words, but he quotes Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I think these lines are just so evocative. Um, if you'll allow me, I just read them to you. Announced by all the trumpets of the sky arrives the snow and driving o'er the fields seem nowhere to, seems nowhere to alight. The whited air hides hills and woods, the rivers and the heaven, and veils the farmhouse at the garden's end. The sled and traveler stopped, the courier's feet delayed, all friends shut out. The housemates sit around the radiant fireplace, enclosed in a tumultuous privacy of storm. And that's Emerson's The Snowstorm. And I just thought I've got to read that because we're not quite there today, but we have a little taste of that today uh, here around Boston. And then just, just the very first verse of Snowbound, if you'll allow me that. This is now we are in Whittier's uh, poetry. The sun at brief December day rose cheerless over hills of gray and darkly circled gave at noon a sadder light than waning moon. Slow tracing down the thickening sky its mute and ominous prophecy, a portent seeming less than threat, it sank from sight before it set. A chill no coat, however stout of homespun stuff, could quite shut out a hard, dull bitterness of cold that checked mid vein the circling race of life blood in the sharpened face. The coming of the snowstorm told, the wind blew east, we heard the roar of ocean on his wintry shore and felt the strong pulse throbbing there beat with low rhythm our inland air. And of course he goes on. Isn't that awesome though? I mean, if you're live in New England, I mean, don't you just feel that <laughs> it's it speaks so much to uh, our life now and then. So it spoke apparently to Eddie's life too. Remember, she's basically a farm girl from New Hampshire in early life, and she knew what it was to be closed in by storm, and so she responded to Snowbound, and let me just share my screen with you. I want to say she responded, but this is a back of envelope kind of response. I don't think it's probably in her mind or anyone else's would be considered good poetry. Oh, and I apologize for the sizing. I had some problems sizing this one, but here's what she wrote. Lines on Reading Whittier's Snowbound by Mary M. B. Glover. By the way, you'll see there above date created. We don't know when she wrote this, but we know it was during the period when she was known as Mary Glover, which would have been uh, before 1870. 
1977. Tired child, I would have slept after his chastening rod, and o'er the past not yet unwept, give but a seldom sob, have slept undreamed the living skies beyond my polar bars, who feel the, the darkness close their eyes, nor stretch the gaze for stars. But through time's chinks thou lettst in light, my curtains hast uprolled, and from the chill and shadowy night, the chariot wheels of old roll back the morn, the dewy morn, with sunshine on its breast, when those were here who now are gone, and would they might now loving come, all silently as thought, to look upon my labor done, and see twere wisely wrought. Like I say, that's back of the envelope poetry for sure. And what we see there is indicative of the way Eddie approached her writing. She was a reviser par excellence. Um, sometimes in the field of religion, uh, we imagine when people deal with words like revelation and so on, uh, that it's a kind of, oh, I don't know, like a gold brick that falls from heaven complete. And you just unwrap it, and there it is. For Eddie and her religious approach, um, she's much more writerly than that. Her core text, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures, published in 1875, goes through hundreds of editions over the next 35 years. She revises it and revises it. And while her critics say, <laughs> you know, how can you call this some sort of God-inspired revelation when it needs revision and editing and so on? Uh, interestingly for her, there doesn't appear to have been any contradiction. She seemed to feel that her vision clarified as years and experience intervened. And one of those key experiences for her, I think, was her encounter with Whittier in 1868. She remembers it all her life, and I'll talk about it in the aftermath in a moment. Again, um, you can see this is just a, a, a transcript from the handwritten document, date created. <laughs> they didn't date it, but we know it's after 1882 because the, the scribe, the person writing down what she says is a guy named Calvin Fry, who is her longtime secretary and major domo, who starts working for in 1882. So this is interesting. This account goes through a few different things, but the heart of it, I think, stays pretty consistent. I'll read it to you because I know her screen doesn't uh, always <laughs> make this too readable. This is something she dictates. Again, it, to me, it's very unfinished. It looks like this didn't go back through revision. It was almost, we found it, I wouldn't call it a scrap, but I'd call it an unfinished doc. So she says, when I was in Amesbury, Mass, whither I had gone for retirement to write, to prepare s &H, Science and Health, my student, Sarah Bagley, asked me if I would not like to go and see John G. Whittier, the poet. I said, no, I have no particular desire to see him. I don't know that I believe her there. <laughs> she's she's a Whittier fan from way back. So maybe she's trying to play it cool. I don't know. She said, everybody that comes here always to see him, uh, use their words missing here. I won't try and fill them in. And if you want to see him, you must see him soon or he is ill and will probably not live long. Ah. That was probably the catnip for Mary Baker Eddy. After her, what she termed her discovery in 1866, she came to believe that she had discovered the principle through which Jesus had healed. And she set about uh, applying this principle with people who were suffering. And so throughout these years, She's writing, taking notes. She's teaching some students her method, but she is also uh, working as a healer herself. So the second paragraph, 
well, said I, if that is his condition, I will go and see him and help him. Upon arriving at his house, I found him sitting before a fire in a grate in July, coughing incessantly with hectic flush on his cheeks and scarce able to speak above a whisper. A number of his Quaker friends were around him. His sister had recently passed on, and the bereavement had been a severe shock to him. His friends were trying to comfort him by talking about death, that he would soon meet her, and how Christ had overcome death and taken away its sting, etc. I sat listening and waiting for an opportunity. Someone asked him why he had a fire. He said, because I am cold. I replied, the atmosphere is more comfortable outside than inside. Ooh, wrong thing to say. He seemed irritated at this and said, I love this line. If Jesus Christ was in Amesbury, he would have to have brass lined lungs to live here. So it goes on. I continued my talk with him in the line, she says, in the line of science. What she means is Christian science, the teachings of this, her embryonic uh, religious teaching. By and by, his countenance changed, and the sunshine of his former character beamed through the cloud, and his friends sat wrapped in interest in the truth that I presented. When I rose to go, he came to me with both hands extended and said, I thank you, Mary, for your call. It has done me much good. Come again. The next day he walked down to the village and was well, never to my knowledge, as he had a return of those symptoms. This plays out in a couple of ways. Eddie and Whittier seem to meet in a kind of shared religious conviction. Uh, and we'll see how this plays out in Christian science in uh, coming decades. This is uh, something that it's not a major theme in Eddie's life, but it's definitely a minor key that is sounded again and again, and that's this encounter with uh, with the Quakers and with Quakerism. Um, <laughs> I just made a note here that Eddie quotes Whittier in one of her books uh, later on. This is uh, this is years later, but it was interesting to me that she circles back to just a really almost a little tagline from him, um, just a phrase. And she writes, this was an emphatic, she's now, she's talking on a, you know, one of her own religious themes. She says, this was an emphatic rule of St. Paul. Behold, now is the accepted time. A lost opportunity is the greatest of losses. Whittier mourned it as what might have been. We own no past, no future. We possess only now. If the reliable now is carelessly lost in speaking or in acting, it comes not back again. Whatever needs to be done, which cannot be done now, God prepares the way for doing. Well, that which can be done now, but is not, increases our indebtedness to God. Faith in divine love supplies the ever-present help and now, and gives the power to act in the living presence. So just touching on some of those themes that maybe knit Quakerism and Christian science on a couple of interesting touch points. Uh, Eddie's own New Hampshire background, as far as we know, didn't bring her into extensive touch with the Quakers. Uh, in fact, she had more familiarity with the Quaker offshoot, the Shakers, um, whom, of course, many so-called, maybe perhaps respectable Quakers felt was a, a sort of heretical sect. There was a Shaker colony not far from where the Baker farm was. And Eddie wasn't deeply familiar with their ways, but she knew them as neighbors, as uh, furniture makers, as peddlers who came to their door. But it wasn't until really the 1860s that I have found that she really comes in contact through a series of friendships with the Quakers in Lynn. But I feel quite sure that by then she is, you know, assimilating Whittier's poetry. 
She knows he's a Quaker. She admires him as an abolitionist, I'm quite sure. And she has several very influential Quaker friendships, uh, one with the Clark family of Lynn, who are really a, a kind of a bulwark for her. And she observes at their table the practice of silent prayer uh, before meals. And this apparently makes quite an impression on her because when she forms her own religious movement and her own denomination and church, the practice of prayer in her church at all services includes a period of silent prayer that is you know, very resonant with Quakerism. In her case, silent prayer is, is joined with uh, the audible saying of the Lord's Prayer. But that repeating of the Lord's Prayer is preceded by this very Quaker-like period of silence. Now, not silence like in a, a traditional Quaker meeting, a silent, uh, an unprogrammed meeting, but one to two minutes of silence, usually. It's a striking feature of the form of worship the Christian scientists have perpetuated, and I think does owe a debt uh, to Quakerism. It's interesting because the Clark family, though, uh, as Quakers, of course, pacifists, nonviolent, uh, plain people. Um, when Eddie's second husband, that disastrous marriage I mentioned, after he had deserted her several times, at least according to some of what we know, he returned uh, in the 1860s to be accepted back one more time. Uh, his wife, Mary, then Mary Patterson, was living with the Clarks. And when he came to the door, Father Clark, her Quaker uh, host, came to the door and almost threw him out of it bodily. <laughs> but she told him to stand back and she uh, told her husband, that they had come to a parting of the ways, finally. There's also a, a strain of, uh, in early Christian science during Ed Eddie's lifetime, she comes in contact with several uh, Quakers who have embraced Christian science. And interestingly enough, one of them is a relative of Whittier's. Uh, and this relative of Whittier's becomes Eddie's pupil in Christian science, has instruction from her in Christian science healing. And we have in our archives an interesting exchange of letters where Eddie asks her to, Whittier is, is dead by then, is passed by then, but asks her if any of his relatives or friends remember her encounter with him in 1868. Uh, what do they remember? Can they confirm it? Uh, she's really asking them to authenticate what she believes is a healing experience that he has. Interestingly enough, um, we don't know the, the extent of Whittier's awareness of Eddie in later years except for kind of two little indicators. One is that this relative, uh, Emma Bear, uh, reports to Eddie that he has showed Whittier one of her manuscripts and that Whittier has read it and looks at it and said, uh, you know, did your teacher write this? Yes, replies the relative. He says, according to her, you won't understand a tenth of this in your lifetime. One thing that's more material evidence, because after that time, a copy of Eddie's book that I mentioned, Science and Health, the Christian Science textbook, is gifted to Whittier uh, by Eddie. And from what we know, it is among his personal possessions at the time of his death. So there's a strand, however fine there, but that meeting in 1868 is really uh, is really the place of of contact and interest. Um, today, the kind of material reminder of Eddie and Whittier's 1868 meeting is found uh, in Amesbury 
uh, Eddie's side of it at least is indicated probably by um, the house that has been maintained by Longyear Museum. Longyear Museum is an independent uh, organization that is really devoted itself to preserving historic sites related to Eddie. I just want to show you there, um, briefly show you. Yeah, just make sure I've got it here. Yeah, if you're interested, you may want to just go to their site. This Amesbury, Massachusetts house where Eddie lives in 1868, that's that Whittier visit, and then later for a period of time in 1870, is still maintained. It's just been renovated. It's open to the public. I haven't been there since the renovation, only before it, but for those of you who are Merrimack Valley folk or uh, you know within, within distance, I've heard that it's well worth a visit. Um, I'd check their website, see when it's opened. It's been pretty faithfully restored. Those of you who frequent Amesbury may recognize the house. It's there, I believe. Um, pardon me, I can't remember if the Main Street in Amesbury is called Main Street. I believe it is. Um, but it's it's there on Main Street. There's some background about the house. Pardon me for scrolling. It drives me crazy sometimes when people do this, but I I don't mean to make you have to sit and read, but the house has been pretty faithfully uh, and restored. It was open uh, last year, I think, during the Amesbury, you know, festival or town days, and uh, Longyear Museum was thrilled with the number of locals who came through and uh, would love to host many more. They're prepared, I think, to talk about Eddie's encounter with Whittier and offer some, you know, interesting touches and, and details. So. Um, Sarah Bagley, her student, Bagley, her student, was uh, the inhabitant and uh, through her father, the owner of this house. And Bagley is one of the earliest students of Mary Baker Eddy. She's Eddie's connection to Whittier. Um, of course, there's always more that I can say or that could be said, but uh, let me just Close the screen down here, stop sharing, and ask, what are you wondering about? What's on your minds from all this? Any question is fair. I certainly may not know the answer, but I'll be glad to try and get you the answer if I don't know. Well, I, I, I have, I don't know if it's a question or what, but um, I, I was a late arriver by about 10 minutes, uh, Mr. Hamilton, so I apologize. Well, I'm glad you joined. But Thanks for being part of it. You may have met us, but we, we used to have a Whittier newsletter, and I used to contribute things from time to time. And I contributed an article by, you probably know who she is. Her name was um, Amanda Gustin. Yes. Researcher at the... Um, Mary Baker Eddy Library in Boston. Yes, yes. Um, but she mentioned that uh, Mary Baker Eddy was a lifelong admirer of of, of Whittier, and mm -hmm. she said she was an avid scrapbooker. Yes. Oh. <laughs> and, and, and that uh, she clipped poems out of literary magazines and, and later quoted his words in her own published writings. And and I, I was I was I was uh, interested and amused by that because as a as a boy, I was an ad, avid scrapbooker, but my scrapbook contained articles about the Boston Red Sox and the Boston yes. Bruins. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sort of indeed. But I, I, I found that to be fascinating, and maybe maybe you could comment on that if you know anything about it. I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, Eddie did keep scrapbooks from fairly early through the end of her life. And mostly clippings, some images, uh, photos. She has she has some photo albums she kept, which are a kind of way for us to know what was on her mind, what she was interested in, especially in her years of obscurity. You know, the especially the eighteen forties through the eighteen sixties, and interspersed through these clippings, Whittier's poetry. It shows up. Uh, I looked at it. Um, 
was going through recently, and I, sh I should have jotted it down, how many of his poems, you know, could I just quickly find, I think quickly, maybe half a dozen. Um, and as you know, as you may know, you know, the 19th century newspapers, and of course, magazines too, uh, published poetry in a way that, unfortunately, we don't really aren't accustomed to anymore, at least in newspapers. And uh, so we, for anyone who is interested, those scrapbooks are in our collections at the library. They've been preserved and are available for people to look at. Uh, I can't say there's a lot of sports news, but there might be a little bit towards the end. <laughs> Yeah, the, the scrapbook. Thank you. That's that's very interesting, I, I find. Yeah, I, I find it interesting too. And I'm uh, I in some like, ways it, it connects her to to this century in my mind. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. And uh like anybody's scrapbooks, like like your boyhood scrapbooks, if somebody is to look at them, they know you in a way, they know what you cared about at that time. And uh, not all your life, but you know the part of life that could be gotten from you know what you could extract from newspapers and magazines. Same, same with her. Yeah, same with her. There's um, there's a number of um, Whittier poems in the Christian Science Hymnal, and I'm wondering if you if you know anything about you know if you could comment on that or have any insight on that. Sure. Yeah. I before we got on tonight, I I thought. Uh, you know, these poems, um, this is where I think you see the sort of res resonance that Eddie felt. And now make no mistake, I, I'm not by any, you know how sometimes people want to do this. I'm not claiming, you know, Whittier as a Christian scientist or a follower of Eddie. That that was not his, you know, his life. But the devotional verse that he wrote really strongly resonated with her and just very interestingly uh very much lines up with a lot of the sort of religious teachings and sentiments of christian science and so there are 10 of his poems in the christian science hymnal uh, this is out of about oh about four well there are over 400 hymns but there are in many cases two settings of a single hymn um let me just give you, I, I won't read through all of the poems, but some of these you'll you'll recognize uh, of his, uh, here's one. Dear Lord and Father of us all, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful mind. In purer lives thy service find. In deeper reverence praise. In simple trust like theirs who heard beside the Syrian sea, the gracious calling of the Lord, let us, like them, without a word, rise up and follow thee. Um, won't even read as much of a couple more. Um, this is this is one that I'm sure uh, you'll see the the resonance. He stood of old, the holy Christ, amid the suffering throng, with whom his lightest touch sufficed to make the weakest strong. That healing gift God gives to them who use it in His name. Yeah, <laughs> you can see why Eddie would have liked that. Um, although it's only fair to say this hymnal that I'm holding that has these 10 dates from after Eddie's lifetime. Uh, but some of the hymns, many of the hymns come from earlier hymnals that do come from her lifetime. She was not the compiler, but she would have been aware of them. So Whittier's poetry in an interesting way sort of lives in Christian scientists' devotional life. And this would be whether or not they would even know anything about him. Although for most American Christian scientists or English Christian scientists, they're probably aware that he's an American poet, at least. <laughs> More than that, I'm not sure. But he's kind of in the, uh, in the stream of Christian science thought in a way that is, I, I'd say in terms of poets, probably unparalleled by any other poets in terms of uh, their contribution. Yeah. I, I find uh, that whole 
thought process raised by Mr. Thompson and which you just spoke of to be interesting because I have on more than one occasion uh, noticed John Greenleaf Whittier's name in a hymn book when I've been in church. And I'm not a Quaker. I, I'm, I'm a Unitarian by upbringing. My wife is an Episcopalian and in and, and both places of worship. I, I've seen it in the hymn book. Yes. And um, yet I, I have read that um, Whittier himself um, was not particularly in favor of singing, of song. And I don't think the Quakers were either. Uh, I don't think right. they in their Quakers meaning. So I think that the, the poetry, which you so eloquently re, uh, recited a little bit there, were, were taken by um, religious persons, I'll call them, and adapted to their, to their hymnals, which I find interesting. Yeah, I'm glad you, sorry for the barking behind me. Um, I, uh, I, I'm so glad you said that because I, I realized I didn't want to make an exclusive claim there. Uh, for his poetry in the Christian Science Hymnal, you're you're exactly right. You know, find him through a number of uh, Protestant hymnals. Um, it's just interesting to me the way he's. The thing that especially interests me is that Whittier, from what I see, is usually his poetry in the Christian Science Hymnal is usually there without adaptation. And what I mean is many other traditional Protestant hymns that made their way into the Christian science hymnal went through a process of adjustment to reflect Christian science theology, which was different from, uh, you know, the Orthodox approach. Whittier stuff, from what I see, makes it in whole <laughs> without any tweaking. Um, just, just interesting. Yeah, and I do believe you're right uh, that the, um, his reticence about music some quaker communities embrace song but i believe his the background he came from they wouldn't have been of music him him music in the way that you know most at least protestant uh folk could conceive of it it's possible too that some of the hymns that came into the christian science hymnal actually came by way of the unitarian hymnal of the time uh the social hymn and tune book, which was actually the first hymnal, the Unitarian hymnal was one of the very first song books that the Christian scientists used in the uh, 1880s before they had their own book. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I've got a quick question for you. Sure. How, how did Mary, or does anybody know, how did she end up in Lynn? Was, uh, yeah. Was it the park, so was it for work or? Yeah, glad to answer. Um, so it's a little bit of a circuitous route, but starting from New Hampshire, her birthplace, where she lives on into her adulthood, except for a very brief period in the South, that first husband who lived six months, he took her off to South Carolina and then died. <laughs> um, you know, pretty tough. But she comes back to New Hampshire, you know, as a widow, lives, she's really dependent in her parents' house until she's in her 30s. She marries again, and the reason I'm detailing this is through that second marriage, they don't immediately go to Massachusetts. They try and make it in rural New Hampshire. He's a dentist. She knows her boy is north of them with these foster parents, and she begs him to go to these small towns where they can live right next to him, and it's a tough situation. He can't really support them financially. And so they go south. They they go south to Massachusetts. Lynn is flourishing. You know, the, the shoe trade is big, lots of people there. I, you know, you think at first, gosh, you know, can a shoemaker afford a dentist? Um, but, well, maybe, but also, uh, you know, there's a gentry in Lynn. The, uh, the the owners the the middle and upper managers of the factories and so they that's really how they land there um she loves lynn which is interesting uh she's there really that's the place she lives the longest of any one spot and is in lynn
I'm sorry, I realized I'm muted there. That was me, accidentally hit the button. Sorry about no. that. No, it's all right, I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> I see we're almost at time, Kaylee. I don't wanna keep people on. Is there anything else that anyone would like to get out there? I'm happy to respond or to find an answer for you if I don't know. Do you have public hours at the Mary Baker Eddy Library or do we need to make a reservation to visit? Um, no, no. How can we come? Yeah, uh, check our website. I, I'll, be, I'll tell you here orally, but I, I don't want to confuse. The first floor of our building, it doesn't belong solely to the library, but it includes a number of historical exhibits that may be of interest. Uh, some of them focus on the Christian Science Monitor because the building we're in is is really a, is the Christian Science Publishing House where the Monitor is uh, is published, along with other you know religious magazines of the church and its offices are there. But that public area and with the exhibits on the first floor, ten to five, uh, except on Sunday, eleven to five, when after the church service lets out next door, on. Uh, Monday through Thursday, 11 to 3, and this is why I said it'd be a little confusing, our research room is open. If you'd like to come in and do research, um, you know, say if you want to come in and see the scrapbooks uh, or whatever else it might be, or learn more about Eddie and Quakers or, well, just a number of things, you can walk in there. You stop at the desk on the first floor. They'll give you a pass to come up to four, and we're glad to host you. Monday through Thursday, 11 through to three. If you have a specific interest, if there is something you want to see, say, I'm just using this because we've talked about it. Say you wanted to see the scrapbooks. It would be a good idea. Call ahead, email ahead. Let us know that that's what you're interested in seeing so the researchers uh, can pull them out and have them ready for you. Um, so if you have a specific interest, a prior contact is always helpful. It can be you'll see there's a way to contact us through email. There's a way to contact us by phone. Um, we're here at your service. Uh, people do sometimes ask this, so I just want to make sure you all know. The The library is, you know, a department of the Christian Science Church, but the archives are really open. And so we're there to support free inquiry. Um, you know, you're welcome to see anything that is open in our collections, which is over 95%, I think, of the Mary Baker Eddy collection. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, we don't try and control what people do with what they see there or the results of their research. What we found is that whether people think a lot or a little of Mary Baker Eddy, they do a better job of covering her and the Christian science movement when they can actually work with uh, original documents. So that's our hope. Does anybody else have any final questions? No, but I'd like to thank you very much for, for uh, a very interesting discussion. Um, Thanks a lot for hanging out with me for an hour, you guys. It was really nice. I I haven't yet been up to the Whittier birthplace, so I'm um, planning to come up when uh, when the weather gets uh, get, gets warm so I can really enjoy it. I'm excited to see it actually. I, I live in Salem, so I'm not that far away and I'm a little bit embarrassed to say I've uh, never been up there. So looking forward to doing that. Well, well I hope you can let visit us. Know us ahead of time because we'd love to, uh, to, uh, to, to meet you personally. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. Yes, I, I will. I will. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. And especially thank you, Michael Hamilton, for your presentation. Um, for those that are interested, our next month virtual lecture is going to feature a speaker from the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site, and that will be oh. on March 23rd at 7 p.m. Oh, that Thank sounds you. fascinating. I may, I may show up for that. <laughs> One of the things in Eddie's scrapbook is a is a card to visit a a a, a, a photo of Frederick Douglass. So, all right, very good. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.